if you have a particular need, um, we can have a, a such discussion about that. But I, I just want to make sure people don't disappear. And if the one thing that's going to upset the ABA is if there's a problem comes up like that. And we don't want to do that. So I, 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 I know you're adults, but you're also not uh, from Delhi for the most part, and the traffic patterns and things like that. Um, so not only work with the international human rights institutions and organizations, but also pioneer in the international human rights advocacy. Ravi started as a follower of Jay Prakash Narayan, who is considered as the, the first uh, individual who is like an institution who started the concept of total revolution and led a large number of the students in Bihar and it has become a real new democratic movement which was instrumental in bringing the human rights movement in India into the mainstream discussion and debate. Farmer socialist worked with a, a, a trade unionist and a uh, very eminent uh, politician, Judge Fernandez. And uh, Ravi was actively associated with the Amnesty International in India and later he worked with the Amnesty International International Secretariat London. While working with the Amnesty International Secretariat, <coughs> Ravi with some of the friends thought of an idea, why don't we start a human rights documentation center in <coughs> South Asia. That brought Ravi back to India and Ravi is actively associated with the International Human Rights Advocacy. And uh, we are really fortunate to have him. And this is Ravi Nayar. Yeah. If some student, there's a PowerPoint presentation. If some students cannot see it, there's some seats over here. They can come here. I'm a Luddite, so I'm not very, <laughs> very comfortable with this PowerPoint. Like, as I was told by Professor Elumalai to make sure that I brought one, I very reluctantly brought one because I believe that this detracts <coughs> from uh, attention and thought and whatever else. But uh, as I told you, I'm a Luddite. Uh, thank you for those kind words, sorry. Professor Shishan Devur, oh, and thank you for having me. Uh, sorry. Thank you for having me. Uh, I will be, I'll speak for an about an hour and then perhaps get you to ask me questions, clarifications, etc. Uh, I have no problems about being interrupted. So it was a concept of an idea or thought that is not clear to you while I'm speaking. Uh, interrupt me and just put your hand up and I'll and let me explain it a little further if necessary because I sometimes tend to forget where each one of us is coming from. Uh, I've been asked to speak on both governmental and non-governmental organizations in South Asia. Let me get the governmental organizations out of the way first. Uh, uh, the, let me even before the slideshow, get the flim-flam of the governmental organizations out of the way. The, each government in the South Asian region, and I don't include Afghanistan, I include India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, Sri Lanka. Uh, I don't include Bangladesh because technically, geographically, it's much more with Central Asia, but for polit geopolitical reasons, it's been put into the South region. And that's um, how politics is played. But that's another subject which I won't go into here. It's one of my hobby horses. Uh, the, let's take start from Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan in the last decade actually had a human rights department in the law and justice ministry. And briefly, under the last government, under the Parvez Musharraf government, it actually had even a human rights minister. Uh, but it was so much hot air because Pakistan was clearly creating an instrumentality as a buffer 
to stop international scrutiny. Pakistan had dismissed human rights for a long time. But suddenly, with things happening in Afghanistan and no longer a forgotten backwater in South Asia, it suddenly found itself under a lot of scrutiny and attention. So it had to conjure up Abra Karabara, this human rights ministry, and uh, to stop international scrutiny, little knowing that uh, it wasn't going to help. I'll be brief here and I'll come back to it. One of the things that the Pakistan uh, government was feeling the heat was not so much the international scrutiny, but the very vibrant social movements in Pakistan. Now I make a differentiation and I'll, at the outset and I'll make it throughout my presentation from the NGO world. Uh, the social movements in Pakistan were extremely aggressive, very vibrant, and very rooted in the community. So they were challenging both the state as well as uh, the other vested, societal vested interests in a very effective manner. And in fact, they were the motive force for the periodic movements against army rule in Pakistan, which is almost a part of the feature of Pakistan. I'm sure all of you know the three A's in Pakistan. You never know which A is at the top. Tariq Ali, who is an Englishman but of Pakistani origin, once coined the word, uh, the phrase that Pakistan is ruled by the three A's. It's the Americans, Allah and the army. And you never know which, arm, which A comes first and when. So at the moment, it's the Americans. It could be Allah tomorrow and in the after it could be back to the army. So it's Ring a ring a roses, pocket full of roses, you just go round and round uh, the mulberry bush on between these three A's. But the social movements are very vibrant and that helps a lot. We then come to Nepal, where again for a long time the government of Nepal under the former king, under the monarchy, under the Panchayati Raj, which is so called basic democracy so-called, it was neither democracy nor basic, uh, was uh, they avoided human rights attention for a long time. However, in 1979, a sea change took place. For the first time, students in large numbers, supported by a new small middle class, a very small minuscule middle class, came out against the monarchy. In the aftermath of the overthrow of the Shah of Iran, in Iran. So the slogan on the streets of Kathmandu, and I was there, uh, was the Shah can go, the king can go. That was the slogan in Nepal. The Shah can go, the king can go. And uh, suddenly the world woke up to the fact that there was a human rights movement. The All Nepal National Free Students Union invited me as somebody to help them organize uh, underground newspapers and underground organization because it was still not possible to organize on the surface and in fact uh, many of these today's political leaders came out of my little workshops on how to organize newspapers and how to print newspapers in Forbes Ganj in Bihar and take them across the border and, uh, and stuff like that but that was a huge amount of a wake-up call to people in South Asia and internationally to what was the potential of the new students coming in. Because until then, uh, only India had seen very powerful students movements in the 70s. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, earlier on in the 67, when a lot of students went and joined the Maoist movement, especially in the states of Andhra Pradesh and West Bengal. But on a, on a pan-South Asian level, this was the first time when suddenly states, non-state actors, media, everyone suddenly rubbed their eyes and said, gosh, uh, this, is, this kind of mobilization is hard to comprehend. Subsequently, in the second wave of the movement, in the late 80s, in Nepal, uh, two 
important changes have taken place. One, that the donor agencies had got into the act. So a lot of the social movements uh, uh, had now elements of what is called the traditional NGO movement funded by donor agencies, both state and private uh, agency members. You saw a new phenomenon which is unique to Nepal. A lot of the NGOs became clearly allied to political parties. Everybody in Nepal knows about them, any keen watcher of Nepal knows about them. But the donor agencies, even if they don't know about them, uh, keep their eyes closed or they want to, do not want to recognize it. So you have the absurd situation of American private donors uh, uh, funding NGOs which are directly linked to the Maoist party. Or the European and Scandinavian donors funding NGOs direct, uh, under the uh, directly controlled by the Communist Party, United Marxist Leninists of the uh, uh, CPI and UML in, in, in Nepal. So you have this absurd situation. It's a very Nepali situation. It doesn't replicate itself in other countries. But, but the, so given this vacuum where suddenly donor money, private and governmental, co-opted a lot of the earlier social movements. The social movements wanted to have new avenues of expression. And that's where the Maoists came in. And they were very smart. They realized that the NGOs had reached a dead end. They were not anymore able to mobilize people because I'll come to why the why later, because it affects the whole of South Asia, not just Nepal. And, uh, so the Maoists understanding that this was a new bandwagon that they could take a free ride on and then more co-opted it in their front organizational activity, uh, took it on very smartly. Uh, they were much more politically astute and adept and organizationally much more competent than all the other political parties put together. Then we come to Bangladesh. In the aftermath of the liberation of Bangladesh in 71, the civil society, in using the broadest meaning of the term, basically thought that the new government would sort out all the problems. They were not able to do it, and they were displaced by an army junta uh, using a coup and suddenly the NGO movement did what is called self-censorship. So you had great NGOs working on the right to health, great NGOs working on microcredit, working on women's rights, on a range of other issues, but on human rights there was, uh, there was an absence of NGOs. There were a few intrepid committed lawyers who did very good work in, in, in the face of great intimidation. But there was not any real NGO movement in the aftermath of the first coup in Bangladesh. It took another 15 or 20 years in Bangladesh for a new kind of social movement once again to emerge. And today you have uh, a much better situation. But you also have a lot of NGOs which are who are basically donor-driven, both governmental and non-governmental. Uh, then we come to Bhutan, and I can dismiss it quickly. It's this little, little Shangri-La, which is not a Shangri-La. It's an extremely rotten king uh, who uh, goes around the world pontificating that he doesn't look at his country with, on gross, gross domestic product or GNP, gross national product or anything. He looks at it from gross national happiness, and the only man is happy there is him. So they only tabulate him and his flunkies in the, in the barons and the nobility. So poor are terrible. And so this little man uh, is, uh, understands that his little Shangri-La is very important politically, geopolitically. So he plays India versus China, China versus the West, and everybody else. And he's, he's great at playing chess board. <coughs> his grandfather and his father, they've inherited this great knack of playing of all the biggies around the region. 
and uh, they have a little private limited company run by the king and his family. Actually controlling a job in the area, so it's much more than multinational that does control. So forget about NGOs, forget about civil society, you try to create any kind of organization unless it's uh, blessed by the king and his progeny. You can find yourself in, in a very deep dungeon very quickly outside the in one of the jails. Uh, they allowed for the first time a few political parties to be formed because there was a lot of international scrutiny about their last elections. But again, the political parties, if they are political parties, it's like the old Soviet Union line political parties you know, for the sake of uh, form. Uh, they lifted their hands when the CP told them to lift their hands. They put their hands down when the Communist Party asked them to put their hands down. So it was, they're not really political parties in the, in the sense that we understand them. You know, vibrant, you know, functioning, boisterous in any democracy that they should be. Sorry. Does there continue to be um, a problem with refugees from Nepal as well, a large population? <coughs> Good question. Uh, there were over 100,000 refugees to start with. Mm -hmm. uh, the first point of entry was India. India uh, abdicating its responsibilities on, on refugees, uh, quietly pushed them into, the, into Nepal. The Nepalese, knowing no better and uh, being uh, unable to exercise any border controls really, uh, allowed these people to come in. So India washed its hands like Pontius Pilate of the responsibility and allowed Nepal to take it on. And uh, like the old man in the sea on Sinbad's back, Nepal didn't know what to do with them because they didn't have the money to do with it. To cut a long story short, I can come back to it later, and permits. The Americans have been extremely uh, generous. They've taken about 50,000 of these refugees in the every uh, over a period of time. I think, in fact, last month uh, marked the 40,000 40, and first refugee to go into the States. So America's uh, quota was about 50,000 that they would take. Uh, a few other countries took a few hundred just for the sake of form under American pressure. Some will be integrated in Nepal automatically because they build businesses, etc. And a few will disperse into the huge Indian hinterland because they'll have found employment. So technically the refugee problem is now uh, flaking out. It's no longer there as it was in the 90s and 2000s. In, in, since 2009, since the American initiative, it's, and the Americans did it both both for humanitarian reasons and also for geopolitical reasons, but I'll go into it later. Both, I mean, genuine humanitarian reasons also, but genuine political, uh, geopolitical interests also. Uh, so you came to uh, uh, Bangladesh and you see now today a much more healthier situation, but you see all, this, all kinds of things. You see social movements, you see uh, NGOs, and in Bhutan, of course, it's nothing really. Then you come to Sri Lanka. I come to India last because that's a huge chunk of what the problem is. You come to Sri Lanka, where there has been major regression. Uh, the Sri Lankan uh, civil society, social movements have always very been very strong since pre-colonial, uh, uh, since colonial times. And uh, in fact, some of the most powerful trade union struggles of colonial period in this part of the world were in Sri Lanka, the organizing of transport workers, the organizing of uh, tea estate workers, plantation workers, and a range of other industries. In fact, not, not due to Trotskyite influence. While Trotsky died in Mexico, uh, and the Trotskyite uh, political formations disappeared in Europe, for some uh, absurd reason, Trotskyism and the political manifestation of it flourished in Sri Lanka uh, in many forms and hues. And uh, so they, many of them did very good organization in, in there. There was also a small communist inf uh, influence and a small social democratic influence. But they were marginalized by the strength of the proxy overshadowing in the trade union movement. 
But post independence, it changed a lot. The divide was became very clear, especially in the early 50s, between the Sinhala and the Tamil populations. Because the Sinhala population clearly <coughs> attempted to deny Tamils their share of their cultural, language, ethnic identity. And uh, once they did that, you, you, the working class, the social movements, the church, you name it, every institution in society got fractured. And uh, this was manifest in, in, in how the Sri Lankan state, uh, which was initially very weak, accrued to itself a lot more powers because of the weakness of civil society and the weakness of any other countervailing forces in, in society. And uh, today the Sri Lankan state is for all practical purposes a uh, very highly militarized state. The NGOs are a joke, they exist only on the websites. Um, all nicely donor driven with lots of money, but exist on in cyberspace. Uh, there are a few community organizations which are still very powerful. And there are some very good lawyers who are still fighting God's own good battle in the courts in defense of civil liberties and human rights. But uh, as, as, as an organized force, they are absent. We come to India, where fortunately for us, the anti-colonial movement gave us a very powerful platform for social organizations, be it in the trading movements, be it student organizations, be it in women's organizations, be it in a range of other areas. Much of it was controlled by the Gandhian movement, but there were very, very important segments controlled by the left, especially in the trade union movement, uh, both the communist left and the socialist left, the democratic socialists like the American, uh, like the old American Democratic Socialist Party which exists, which went up in, into Saipan or whatever, smoke, Norman Thomas and others who did fight elections in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, but uh, uh, no longer exist, they accept perhaps in some history books. Um, but uh, you, uh, they were very powerful in the 20s and 30s, they got a fair amount of votes when Norman Thomas stood for pres President of the United States, especially after, in the aftermath of the Depression. But uh, you see that in India, the Indian Civil Liberties Union predates the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by a good 14 years. The Indian Civil Liberties Union was formed in 1934 by no less a person than somebody who became the, president, the Prime Minister of Independent India, Jawaharlal Nehru. And the General Secretary was uh, the main leader of the opposition after independence, who was then the General Secretary of the Socialist Party, the Democratic Socialist Party, Dr. Raman Lohi. So the Indian Civil Liberties Movement had a broad cross-section, including it had, it, it, it had uh, from the right to the left representative, you had a very right-wing politician also in it, N.C. Chatterjee, who uh, belonged to the Hindu Mahasabha, but uh, was an independent member of the Hindu Mahasabha, member of parliament, uh, and uh, yet was very good on civil liberties. So you can see today's uh, right-wing Hindu parties clearly don't have any historical overview of what their predecessors did in terms of civil liberties. But like Bangladesh, in a much earlier fashion, suddenly there was, uh, uh, after independence, there was a great attack of amnesia. And we are good at it, we, because culturally we are non-deterministic, unlike Christians or Muslims. So culturally as Hindus, we are non-deterministic. So we, we live more in myth rather than in fact and more rely on fiction. So it's easy to forget things in, in, the, Indian cult, in the Indian cultural context. Uh, a lot of our problems today arise out of this non-deterministic culture. Uh, as the old Jewish proverb puts it, uh, those who do not learn from history are condemned to repeat it. And we, keep, we live that uh, old Jewish saying almost daily. We keep constantly forgetting 
uh, historical past. Uh, so we, we, we completely said that you know, India is independent. Thank you very much. There will be no human rights problems. So let's disband the Indian Civil Liberties Union. So in 1948, we disbanded the Indian Civil Liberties Union uh, with two important dissent, uh, dissenting voices, Dr. Lohia, who was prescient on this, and uh, Mr. Nagpai, who was also a very important member of parliament, uh, and who uh, also attacked it. But the, the, the Congress mainstream just forgot about civil liberties. The communist uh, component of the civil liberties movement suddenly became very radical and took to arms struggle. So they didn't have any time for civil liberties. The Russians at that time, in, under Stalin, had given a very foolish line called the Zhadanov line, which basically said all the newly uh, independent colonial countries must take to arms struggle to throw, overthrow the Comprador bourgeoisie, as they called it. And uh, so suddenly, uh, Parties which had a fair amount of political strength took to arms struggle and uh, were destroyed by the state systematically. Their frontal organizations were destroyed. They became a shadow of themselves. So they had to recreate their strength once again in the 50s and early 60s. So this was a disastrous political line. So it destroyed, it, 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 it manifested itself. I'm only alluding to it because it manifested itself in the destruction of the communist element in the civil liberties movement also. So the only component of the civil liberties movement which tried to keep civil liberties movement alive in the 50s was the old socialist tradition because the communists had been crushed thanks to the armed struggle. The Congress had decided that under the Congress new rule everything was hunky-dory and there was no need for civil liberties. Thank you very much. Everything was fine. So there was this minuscule socialist trying to be political dissenters, political opposition, civil libertarians <laughs> and everything under the sun didn't work very well. The turning point once again came in 1967-68, where a new uh, ferment amongst India's tribal and marginalized, po marginalized populations, led by young Maoists, whom we call uh, under a broad rubric Naxalites, uh, because they emanated from a certain village. The first incident, armed incident, took place in a village in Nakshalbari. In not Bengal, but uh, this was a very broad popular movement, and it was, in fact, it was not really, it was not really communist. In fact, it was more like, uh, if you if look at it now from hindsight, you look at it, it was like the pre-revolutionary, pre-communist Narodnya Volya movement in pre-revolutionary Russia, where it was back to the people. So the uh, where pe where the call was given of youngsters to leave colleges and universities and go away to the villages to organize uh, peasants and uh, it had some very uh, tragic uh, ends and it had some very long term uh, benefits, uh, benefits in certain areas. It, it varied in different parts of the country. But the repression let loose by the state, especially in, in uh, West Bengal, to a lesser extent in not lesser in, in terms of severity but just in sheer numbers uh, and to a smaller extent in Kerala was severe. So uh, scratch your eyes, open your ears loud and clear, a hundred thousand youngsters between the ages of 16 and 30 lost their lives in the period between 1967 and 1974 and there's no history about it. There is no history about it. We Indians are great at forgetting things. We Indians are great at sweeping 100,000 people. The whole of the Chilean coup, Pinochet, who is embedded in your mind as somebody who is a horrible person with two horns and fangs and whatever else in the Western mind. Pinochet is the, the whole Pinochet anti uh, the coup, counter coup that he launched against Allende and the popular front only killed 3,600 people. Argentina killed an equal number, the Kermits. This is a hundred thousand people killed in cold blood. People taken to irrigation canals, rivers, graveyards, and a bullet put at the back. Thank you very much. There is no historical memory.
this in India. There wasn't a historical memory, but there was a very deep popular memory. People remember. The state didn't remember, the media did not want to remember, the middle class did not want to remember, but the people remember. People did not forget. It's thanks to this public people's memory of the people of the disenfranchised, underprivileged, the marginalized sections of population that after 40 years, just two months ago, uh, Deputy Inspector General of Police in Kerala called Mr. Lashmana went to prison because he had killed a young boy who was an Naxalite activist called Varghese in cold blood and the after, in India, this, we, we don't have a, what do you call it? What do you have the guy, the young private, Bradley Manning, the guy who was the uh, root of the WikiLeaks. Bradley Manning. We don't have any Bradley Mannings in India, unfortunately. We don't have any of these guys. Uh, I think, again, that's to do with determinism and non-deterministic culture. But I won't go into the cultural underpinnings uh, of that. Uh, the, the brand, we had one Mr. Ramachandran Nair, a constable, who was the man who pulled the trigger on the orders of Mr. Lakshman, who initially shoot in his, in his book, which has come out posthumously, and in his affidavit to the Central Bureau of Investigation, the Indian version of the FBI. He said that I, had, I did not want to kill this innocent man, we'd already captured him. And I told him that we should take him to judicial custody. But the officer said that if I did not shoot him, uh, he, he would shoot, the officer would shoot me and that suspect. So, having no alternative, I shot him. Fortunately, he saw this affidavit before he died in, uh, in the court, and it was on the basis of that he just didn't want to die with this on his conscience. Not many Indian policemen have this great uh, sudden pang of consciousness. The, otherwise, the Indian executive and the bureaucracy and the police and the middle class and the media have a very nice Indian disease called an acute attack of laryngitis. <coughs> you can't speak anymore, you suddenly go silent and you don't ever say anything. Uh, so, you, and you tend to, you, your memory is suddenly, you know, just like a computer, press delete, uh, it's all gone. So, uh, this, apart from the Lakshmana case, there is no single case of prosecution across the country. We saw, we, we saw a whole new term being added to the human rights lexicon, which, which is a major Indian contribution, the term encounter deaths, which is basically extrajudicial executions. The dictionary, dictionary says encounter means two people shouting or firing at each other, etc. This is when two people shout firing at each other. This was just people being taken to irrigation canal, being arrested, not being brought in front of any judicial officer, and then a bullet being put pumped at the back of your head at point blank range. We are, we are, we are experts at it. Even the Russians and Chechnya have to learn from us, the Argentinians and the Chileans and all are a bunch of schoolboys and girl guides when we've has, has, has we've perfected the art of extrajudicial execution. And yet, internationally, we've not come under any great scrutiny. Uh, that's again for good geopolitical reasons, but I'll come to that subsequently. You saw this period of major repression. Then we had the emergency. Prior to the emergency, the first attempt to create a civil liberties movement on the uh, repression after the demise of the Indian Civil Liberties Union of 1934 in 1948 was the People's Union for Democratic Rights, uh, Civil Liberties and Democratic Rights, PUCLDR, and an organization called APDR in West Bengal, in, very specific to West Bengal, and a small organization in the state of Andhra Pradesh called the Andhra Pradesh Civil Liberties Council. Now, all three of them were very, very small. I remember the first meetings of the, PD, uh, the Andhra Pradesh, uh, uh, the PUDR, uh, uh, PUCLDR, were held in the house of an old Gandhian, which has now become a beautiful old, beautiful new cultural center for the Spanish speaking people in India, called the Institute of Cervantes. It was an old colonial Bangladesh owned by an old Gandhian who allowed, used to allow us 
to meet at his house and we were in the in the, we were very powerful uh, vocally but in numerically we were could be counted on exactly one hand it was Swami Agnivesh it was myself it was an old Gandhian called Mr. Ramadhar it was a lady called Pramila Lewis who was then a trade union organizer and a late lady who used to teach at the National School of Drama called the Ischil of the Swami Nathan who later on went and worked amongst the tribals in Rajasthan in Maswara district. We, we were the grand total of five and every once in a while we had a student come and join us for two or three meetings and drop out. But this, we were the uh, five faithfuls. Uh, for a f time before the emergency came crashing down on us. Many of us, including me, were guests of the government uh, for a year or so, some for longer. Uh, and so, um, some of the US students may not know what the emergency is. So maybe we don't get much yeah. history in the US. Uh, thank you for that. The, the, to the outside observer, India has been a continuing democracy. Uh, now, it's not been a continuing democracy, we've had flaws all along, but the emergency marked an official suspension of civil liberties. The fundamental rights chapter of the Indian constitution was suspended, habeas corpus was suspended, we had the absurd situation of the Supreme Court of India, so don't believe everything the judges tell you. Uh, the absurd situation of the judges of the Supreme Court, when they had to eat it up three times over in the emergency and I hope they all <coughs> felt awkward and gluey and whatever else. They suspended habeas corpus. They allowed the then Attorney General of India, a man called Nirende, to argue in court and upheld that argument to say that un under an emergency, this, a policeman had the right to shoot anybody and no questions could be asked. Thank you very much. So a little over 100,000 good people were put into jail, including the former uh, for Prime Minister after the emergency, Mr. Morai right. Desai, almost the whole political opposition from left to right, it didn't matter what uh, persuasion, but I had a uh, wonderful guest, I, uh, in my barrack I had Prakash Singh Badal, the present Chief Minister of uh, Punjab uh, as my cellmate, I had on the other side Hari Vishnu Kamat, a member of parliament. I had, I was in great company. I learned a lot because I, you, what better teachers could you have than the who's who of India's political uh, firmament? Uh, but the emergency basically suspended all civil liberties. Parliament was extended beyond uh, for a year uh, beyond its term by Ukase, by edict, by by an ordinance, uh, and. If you went into Delhi those days, uh, you had every tea shop and restaurant with a small poster which said, please do not talk, discuss politics. <laughs> that was the level of fear. There was a complete climate of fear. So across Delhi, uh, there was nobody who discussed politics. People refused to open your door, their doors to you if you were underground or somebody who was well known. Uh, someday, when I, before I kick the bucket, I'll write my autobiography. <laughs> But, uh, but uh, there, has, there hasn't been a very good uh, book on the emergency except by an English author who just partially deals with it, David Seldon, uh, who done a Penguin publication in the late 70s called Explosion in the Subcontinent. Mm. The Indian uh, uh, a justice uh, Commission of Enquiry was set up after the emergency called the Shah Commission of Enquiry. Uh, which was again conveniently forgotten and uh, in fact the Mrs. Indira Gandhi when she came to power to make sure that there was no real memory at all pulped all the reports, copies of the reports, pulped them all from all and withdrew them from all government libraries and institutions. So if today if you're looking for uh, copies of the Shah Commission report apart from the fact that they are available in the Central Secretariat Library, the law, uh, the law in, uh, Indian Law Institute Library, uh, the Parliament Library. There's no other public library which has copies of it. Fortunately, it's being finally addressed. Uh, former civil servant called Mr. Devasahayam, who was the detention officer of Jayaprakash Narayan, uh, uh, suddenly, before he kicks the bucket, decided that uh, he's going to do his amends. So he's publishing 
the Shark Commission report once again. So we do hope he does a good edited uh, version of the Shark Commission report. The emergency was really a watershed in India's democracy. Uh, political parties were banned. Uh, parliament's term was extended for a year without any good thing. Uh, anybody who's, who even muttered a, a few words under his breath against the government was cut it off. Uh, the largest number of people were there, were there for 100,000 stretch, but over, but many much much uh, smaller numbers went in and out of jail for a couple of weeks, couple of months, etc. Uh, and that, if you add those figures up, they, it would come to at least 300,000 people went in and out. But 100,000 people spent. Uh, anything between a year and 19 months in jail. So the emergency was a watershed. It was it's been completely forgotten uh, as something that is in the public memory. There's no public memory of it today. In today's generation, if you say emergency, is what's that? Is that an is that an are you referring to an emergency exit door when the flight when uh, <laughs> flight suddenly has a roll or something like that? There's no public memory of it. So you had the emergency in India, and then you had, of course, the first time the PUCL, they are really coming out of it. But it split between those who believed that civil liberties was much more, including democratic rights, including land rights, including peasants' rights, including uh, the right to correct wages, etc. And those who believed that it was only uh, related to civil liberties in the liberal tradition constitutional liberties. So there was a split, some called it the left-right split. It wasn't uh, a left-right split because there were elements of the left in the PUC which continued, continue until today. And there were liberal elements in the PUDR which continue until today. It was basically on the issue of democratic rights. Whether It was the old divide between whether civil and political rights are more important than economic, social and cultural rights which also manifested itself in the international debate in the 60s and 70s in Geneva during the Commission of Human Rights at the UN and elsewhere. It was bread of freedom or bread and freedom debate, uh, which was the way it was put in the US uh, uh, public debate. So please. So it's about if there's any kinds of clash between the human rights itself and the national security, like what do you say about the Indian situation? Do you think that maybe the priority should be given to the national security or on the human rights or vice versa? Mm -hmm. I, I don't, are you, are, you, are you studying in the US? No, you're studying the India Civil Oh, you're studying the India Civil I will I, I I, I only go to a great American called Jefferson. 250 years ago, Jefferson says that those who are willing to s sacrifice liberty at the altar of security deserve life. So I will only quote great America. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff said, anybody who sacrifices liberty at the altar of security deserves neither. And we have this debate in India today. I'll come to that uh, later. We have this debate. It's a focus, focus debate created by the state as a spokesman to erode democratic rights of the people. Because actually, sir, after the events of uh, events of September, Jordan Bush, he said actually in front of uh, national TV here that uh, national security should be put as a priority. Well, not only Mr. Bush. So that is, yeah, that's yeah. an example. Yeah. Not only Bush, a lot of people uh, who are Bush clones here said the same thing. <laughs> uh, but uh, in this part of the world. But all I say is they needed to go back to what this great American founding father of the American Republic and Constitution, Jefferson, said. So, and, uh, they should also remember what the Indian founding fathers on civil liberties said. There were great many of them, men of great integrity and, uh, and academic scholarship. But uh, that, I'll come to that, uh, expand on that later. Time permits. So we have this today situation where the PUCL and the PUDR were more social movements. They were not NGOs of the kind that are today. As a PUC member, you you met in state chapters or city chapters. You put in your own money. There was no state funding. There was no international NGO funding. There was no donor agency funding. The PUDR used to meet at a small coffee shop in the in a cultural center called the Triveni Kalasangam on Saturdays until they got turfed out because it became more upmarket and all the 
corporate honchos started hanging around there in their black suits and briefcases. So the the chola wallas, the ones the ones with the cloth bags and the kurtas and pajamas got thrown out. It's, 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 it's in a way epitomizes how Indian middle class has moved down in more ways than one. So you put in your own little pocket money and you ran your investigations, you went to Andhra Pradesh, you went to Orissa, you collected money on the streets in Delhi University or on uh, in Regal Corner in Connaught Place with a box on Saturdays and uh, used that money. So there was no dawn agencies etc. In the mid 80s suddenly the new phenomenon started, the donors started coming in what you would call in the American, in the aftermath of the American Civil Liberties and the American Civil War, the carpet baggers, the ones with the carpet bags, with lots of money. And so today you have a great divide in the Indian human rights movement. The donor-driven NGOs and the social movements. So in, I'm not saying that the donor-driven NGOs, all of them are useless. Many of them are completely useless. But some of them at least put out decent reports. But the social movements are still very powerful. The Narmada Bacha Adlo, the peasant struggles in Orissa, Chhattisgarh, uh, Oris, um, in the mining areas, the tribal, in the, these are all social movements of landless peasantry who are extremely powerful, very rooted in the community, and are a challenge to the state in many ways. In many ways. The state. Sorry. Right in Karnataka. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. The Raja Sangha in Karnataka, which is a peasants' organization uh, run by a, a very Rose. former friend of mine, an uh, old socialist, Nandim uh, Sami, who did great organization, had great organization skills and created a very powerful movement. But there was also a powerful movement that he built upon. The movement started by Gopal Gowda in, before that. And so he was able to build on it very nicely. Uh, Karnataka has a great tradition of, um, of social mobilization, and like the other parts of India. Uh, so, you had this contradiction, and that contradiction until today remains. The state is very happy with the contradiction. So, because the donor driven NGOs, controlled by an Indian law called the FCRA, the Foreign Contribution Rate, no Indian NGO can take money from any international source without the permission of the Indian Intelligence Bureau. So it's like the FBI saying you as an NGO somewhere in you know, Georgia, Atlanta, can't take money without the FBI saying you can. They'd be held to pay. The American Civil Liberties Union would take a tomahawk and go for some scraps. But we don't have an organization of the strength and the efficacy of the American Civil Liberties Union. So, uh, we have the state massively encroaching on So, when the NGOs which take donor money, even if they are run by good people, a lot of them are still run by good people, do self-censorship because otherwise the tap is closed immediately by the state. So, they do self-censorship. So, for example, there's hundreds of N women's NGOs working on dowry debt <coughs> on the issue of rights to the girl child, but ask them what, whether they are working on women in prisons, women in situations of conflict, in armed conflict areas, in certain areas, you will find dead silence. Because these are the, what the state has informally said as no-go areas. And so everybody follows the rule, everyone's happy, and the gravy train moves on. Uh, so there is that dichotomy, whereas social movements don't recognize this. And social movements say, look, whatever the community decides are the priorities we follow. So there's a, there's a difference between that. That contradiction will take some years to iron out because there are certain historical processes that are at work and we can't short circuit those historical processes. But I'm sure the social movements will win, win in the next 10 to 20 year time span because they are much more rooted on the ground than these uh, middle class NGOs. <coughs> the uh, Indian state has been a lot more sophisticated in its handling of the civil liberties movement and human rights movement than other states. We are not Putin's Russia. We are not Mugabe's 
Zimbabwe. We are not even Chile, Pinochet Chile, or the Colonel's Argentina. So we don't, we don't officially bludgeon them. You close the finding tap in the first instance, because the Indian state understood long time ago what Napoleon said in 1815 during his retreat from Moscow. Napoleon said this very famous saying that when he was losing and retreating, it was not because the French troops were any better or less better than the Russians or the Prussians or the Austrians or, or the English. It was just because they didn't have, the supply lines were too long and drawn out. And Napoleon said this famous quote, an army marches on its stomach. They didn't have the supply lines and they were decimated 